Hello and welcome to Summit Pacific's education event for National Diabetes Month. And we are devoting tonight's education to a talk on diabetes and its impact not only on your feet, but also on your vascular health. Tonight we have Dr. Hess of um, Foot and Ankle Surgical Associates and he is going to talk to us about the vascular system of the foot and how to care for diabetic wounds. But he also has a special guest speaker himself, um, an interventional cardiologist, Dr. Superwall, who's going to join him. And he's going to talk about the procedures and how he can restore circulation. And it's really interesting information and very important information. And I'm now going to turn the show over to Dr. Hess. Thank you, Dr. Hess. Hey guys, thanks for being here. Um, one interesting thing for me doing these sorts of talks, it's different because I like the interaction and it's a little different going with this sort of venue. Um, but I look forward to questions because this is uh, an interactive subject, of course. And I feel really lucky to be a podiatrist in this time because because there's so many new things that have come about that has really evolved in a way that's given us so much more opportunity to change lives, get in the foot to heal, less limb loss, and our patient outcomes just seem to be a lot better. Um, it's not just the care, but it's prevention too. So I'll kind of go through that. I sometimes talk fast, so if that happens, just slow me down. Hey, Joni. Um, so the diabetic foot, this is a big topic for us, 15,000 podiatrists, it occupies about 30% of our patients. So the objectives aren't to show you scary pictures, although I have some, uh, it's a good idea to kind of share some wacky things that can happen. And so prevention and prevention are the two most important things. What I'm gonna hit here are a few things to look for, maybe what to think about uh, if you're a patient, if you're a provider, you know, then what to do when you should be referred to a foot doctor or to someone. And then what we can do to prevent the worsening of things. You know, how can we help the patient care and make it better? And so I'll hit on some of those and then I'm hoping you guys hit me with some good questions too. Some of the statistics I'll be sharing are old numbers. It's a changing target and sometimes changes because of the thresholds. Um, for example, diabetes used to be, if your blood sugar was so bad that it was in your urine, then you were considered diabetic. And now we've really pulled that back to where anybody who has changes that could harm them, they kind of fit into that group of diabetic. Um, the other thing we're doing is preventing amputations from the diabetic conditions and problems that come about. Um, I'll also be talking about diabetic neuropathy These numbers on healthcare costs are way more than what we're seeing on this slide. It just reminds us that this is an expense, not just in the actual healthcare cost, the medical cost, but also the cost to the person who's not able to work, take care of their family, live life. So it's this loss of productivity. So we forget about the importance often of glycemic control or keeping your blood sugar good as a patient because you don't always feel bad when your levels are off. And so unless you're controlling it, it means it's controlling you. And so you have a huge risk of getting a diabetic foot ulcer if you develop diabetes, especially diabetes out of control. So things to think about, always control your blood sugar. Um, these things that happen, it harms the organs, your vision, your kidneys, you can get infection, you can land in the hospital, your neuropathy, which again, we'll talk about quite a bit, keeps getting worse. So you can't feel things. And then as your blood sugar gets out of control, your other labs start to wane and then you just don't heal well. So your wound healing falls apart. I'm guessing everyone in the audience knows what hemoglobin A1C is. It's just a three month marker for how you've been doing with your blood sugar control. And it really does predict the outcomes. 
So if you come to a foot doc, our main concern is your foot, but really it is your overall health. So we're going to ask these questions. So once it starts going up, you run the risk of getting an, a need for an amputation or an infection. Um, preventive measures, always, 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 it just reduces the rates. And that's what we're here to do. And going to Summit Pacific, the group of docs there, the providers are amazing because they're, they've been really good about being on top of this through my eyes and for us. Um, some things to think about diabetic education. People know they're not supposed to smoke, but they still smoke. Why? So education is important, but we have to get in our heads sometimes to really make us change some of the things we do. So diabetic education is important, but then acting out on that education is tough, really tough. The next part is follow up with your primary care or your foot doc. So for us, the American Diabetic Association has created sort of thresholds how often you should be seen based on your blood sugar, the extent of your diabetes, things like that. Um, we're always trying to get that a hemoglobin down, the hemoglobin A1C into a good range. So the lab values are important. Superficially to us, they're important. But on a deeper level, we're more interested in the physical examination, how it looks, how things are. So. Walking into a room with a diabetic foot, you can notice some things right off the bat. If someone's missing hair, for example, we know their circulation's not as good. The color of the foot, the temperature. So it's real important if you're at home checking your feet, if you're a primary care doc, family practice, someone checking things, always look at all the systems, circulation, sensation, the skin, the bony structures. A deformed foot is much more at risk because then there's areas of pressure that can happen. Um, in school, we were taught to look, listen, and feel. It's important to really take time to, to do that. Neuropathy. Um, neuropathy really just means something wrong with the nerves. And by something wrong with the nerves, that can be too much sensation, not enough, loss of temperature, you can't feel pressure. And it almost seems like it happens to near everyone who's diabetic, who has diabetes. It's a metabolic pathway that I believe is more part of it. Although if your circulation's not the best, it can impair the circulation to the, the electrical system, the nerves. So metabolically, we think about when we have neuropathy getting worse and worse, we know something must be missing. And so what is it? This is almost a whole one hour talk on how just our vitamins aren't utilized well, B1 doesn't get correctly metabolized. And so then the nerve destruction begins. And so back to nutrition, which I'll hit on here shortly, nutrition matters. You are what you eat. So it's not just medications, it's also the basics. Let's see, you got a question. Are there nutritional options that help with that? Yes. So if you think about vitamin D, for example, when did we fortify milk with vitamin D? It's been a long time ago. And so we've known these things are important. And in healthcare, it seems that we often find things that wax and wane. Nutrition, we forget about it. And most of us who want to help people with diabetes or anything, you want to make sure that their overall health is at the top of the game. And so keeping a well-balanced diet, multivitamins often. This will prevent the nerve damage, so then there won't be as much nerve damage. And don't forget, your eye is one of our biggest nerves. So you can get retinopathy, which is really some nerve conditions too. And let me know if I'm going too fast. I can talk pretty fast. So with neuropathy, and the reason we're going to hit on this is this is one of the primary reasons that people develop wounds on their feet. And so you test for it. 
a lot of times it's hard to test for, but your doctors are going to do a good job with um, a monofilament to test different areas. The gold standard now is a nerve biopsy. This is where you take a small piece of skin around the ankle, and then a microscope is used to measure how many nerve fibers are in a small area. And then this can kind of gauge how far along it is. So we know if we need to get all worried about it or not. So testing is important. Physical exam can often do that. I mentioned earlier that this is a wonderful time to be in this specialty. So we really have an opportunity to evaluate people from home. So there's different ways that we can do that. So somebody could monitor their blood sugar at home and then it would get sent to a database. If it's off, then you would need to make an appointment. In podiatry, we use a camera, a thermography camera to measure temperature. We know that the temperature change of two degrees or more tells us there's a spot on the foot that's in trouble. Sadly, we often get that foot after bad things have happened, so then you're backpedaling. So we missed out on our prevention part. So we use a company that helps us do home monitoring. Um, super simple, inexpensive, and it's going to revolutionize limb loss and infections. This is an interesting slide of a CT scan of something called Charcot. Charcot is where the nerves are damaged enough where the bones in the foot break and it collapses. And so as the foot collapses, it develops areas of pressure. And those areas of pressure then open up into a sore. And so I just got this little CT scan from our machine in the office. And I'm not sure if I can make it play or not. Do you know if I can? What, I just hit the space bar? I don't know on this system how to do that. Anyway, it just shows a, it's a little video of a CT scan that kind of shows how important it is to look inside the foot with x-rays. So you can identify changes or potential problems because those are the areas generating the pressure and the heat. Well, there we go. Bam. So it's amazing what technology can help us with. So from this sort of study, you can identify the piece, the spot that's had trouble and address it. Even though technology is helpful, look, listen, and feel, meaning take a look and understand all that's really important. For us, if somebody had a pressure sore and we really wanted to get it to go away with a foot like this Charcot foot, for example, we might make a small incision on the side of the foot and then remove that bony prominence. By removing that piece of bone then, they might be able to have a much better um, foot that's plantigrade, we call it, that'll fit in a shoe and won't have any of that trouble. So things for you to look for, things for us to look for, are different areas of irritation, pressure, callus. So on this slide, I have a foot that they stepped on something, could have been a threshold, could have been anything that split the skin. And once the skin's been injured, if you don't feel it, it can get infected, develop more trouble, and lead to things. Healthcare is to keep good health. So the slide that shows the toenail, for example, it's had a lot of trouble with fungus, which puts pressure and then causes a pressure sore. Um, the other one is just a pressure callus. And this um, top right picture, they've lost a toe clearly. Um, and now they're developing a new pressure area. And that new pressure area can be prevented with uh, offloading special shoes. So types of wounds, I'm going to whip through this pretty fast. Um, a lot of them are mechanical from runners, blisters, pressure, corns and calluses. 
Uh, corns are just a callus on a toe. You know, a diabetic ulcer is what we're sort of talking about here. Circulation and then trauma. So, of course, I have to show some pictures. Um, gangrene is when you lose circulation. And Dr. Superwall is going to share a little bit at the end here about that. Um, but as your circulation gets restricted, then small injuries can't heal themselves. And so those blood vessel restrictions lead to more trouble. This is a gunshot wound, sort of not for this lecture, but we definitely in Grace Harbor County get to see those. And to the question, you know, on nutrition support, it's really important to keep everything balanced. We do lab work on our diabetics, as most doctors do if they're albumin, their protein, if these things are diminished, then they don't have the wherewithal in their system to even heal something simple because you need all those components, growth factors and all these to, to heal it. And if the circulation is not bringing those nutrients, it, it has even a more bigger challenge. So you are what you eat. Make sure you have a good diet. Multivitamins aren't a bad idea just to keep the the gas tank full on all those items. We try to send our diabetics if they're not already engaged in a nutrition program of some kind. Summit Pacific tends to be really good at these, uh, making sure that all the balances are happening. We could go through the minutia, which I'm not planning to do today, on what vitamins can do. Um, or is it better said, the lack of vitamins causes so it doesn't mean you have to take a bunch. You just have to get thresholds, our baselines, our recommended daily allowance. So the skincare I'll hit in a minute on what's best to be done to kind of keep the skin integrity safe from splitting, from pressure, from force. Um, as far as how often to see a podiatrist, if you have loss of sensation, reduced vascular sensation, or callus from a bony prominence, it's every 63 days. What does that mean? Well, insurance allows every nine weeks to have foot care. Foot care means cut your toenails, calluses, check the circulation, and keep the foot safe. And so that's been for years and years, healthcare is allowed for that. So for this, again, treatment prevention, 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 nutritional support, stay healthy, which often means exercise. It's not just about what you eat. You have to keep the body in motion. Debridement um, talks about shaving the calluses or removing the dead or devitalized tissue. Um, Orthotics, these are arch supports or devices that offload the prominent areas or even out the forces. So if you can't feel the forces being excessive, those forces are diminished by offloading so you don't get pressure areas. And that comes in the form of arch supports, shoes. If you have a wound, then this picture shows a knee scooter, um, casts, shoes, boots, all kinds of things to take pressure away. Because our goal is to keep people running around doing fun stuff. Ski season's coming up, and if you like to ski, you'd hate to have some reason to have to stop. And so this just shows some different offloading devices, arch supports. We make replicas to do that. Um, if you think about the front end of a car, if it's out of alignment, the tires wear out quickly. If our feet are out of alignment, they wear out quickly too. And especially if you have reduced circulation or sensation. Um, debridement, again, debride is what you married, debride is what you do to a wound. So however you pronounce it, it re means just removing the, the problem, the pathogens. Often there's enough infection where someone might need antibiotics but keeping it healthy and clean. So you shave away the dead devitalized tissue to promote the growth factors that are naturally in our blood to come into the party and help heal the wound. Hopefully these aren't too gross of pictures. 
Um, so it can be a scalpel, um, mechanical, where you just shave it away with um, the blade, or you might use a bandage type, special irrigation. And then there's also enzymes that debride wounds. And again, this is after we've failed in on the prevention part. So these punched out wounds look like they're literally a hole punch, <clears throat> and it's because they can't feel it, neuropathy. And so these we don't want to have too many of. I brought up a wound vac because this is an interesting technology that helps restore circulation, even if you have bad circulation. So it draws in with a vacuum system, blood flow. What this does then is promote the growth factors to come in and allow the wound to heal. It's powerful. It's a bit of a nuisance to have to do, but it really works well. We'll do them with wounds, with skin grafts, and even if they're infected, it's still a worthwhile treatment. So this shows a series of what happens. So the dead tissue from gangrene goes away, gets removed. Then there's a healthy base on that red picture. That's what you're looking for. And then as it pulls in the growth factors, the skin grows and it restores itself. So as far as things to do for wound healing, we could talk for days on this one, but you want to address the bio burden, meaning the bacteria that's just naturally living there. Antibiotics, oral, injectable, topical will help get rid of that. Um, and then protective barrier for hydrating, Joni asked about that. So definitely using topical emollients, lotions. And if you have a lot of callus, where the skin thickens, it can actually crack around the heels. Ammonium lactate cream is one that helps slough the dead skin. So it prevents a lot of that. Once you have an open wound and you don't have skin, then you need things of like skin grafting. As time's gone on, the complicated skin grafting where you harvest it, which I'll show you here ahead, um, you would take it from other body parts, remote body parts, and these self grafts leave a new wound where you've taken the skin from and you put it on the wound you're treating. So now you have two wounds. So hopefully you haven't caused trouble. And we're seeing less of these types of skin grafts. Once in a while, we'll rotate skin to the area. Um, and so we also use different materials from artificial, other animal type um, skins that come up. And again, we're not using as much of this, but we are using something a lot that comes from the placenta. And this skin grafting material has 250 plus growth factors in the placental tissue. And this is magic. It works exceedingly well. The complicated part is it's expensive, so insurance coverage. And so um, foot doctors are really good about getting this handled so we can get this authorized. And then it shortens the time that you have the open wound or the sore. So a lot of this is focused on once the problem happens, but don't forget that the prevention's everything. This just represents some algorithms for diagnosing things. So we follow a really stepwise approach, whether it's circulatory, musculoskeletal, neurological, we have kind of algorithms we follow. The most important thing, we're all so darn different, we can't treat everyone the same. And so everything's sort of personalized based on your individual needs, your job, and all the considerations. That Sharko foot video that I showed earlier, this is what happens to the underside of that foot as it collapses. I put this slide in because the effort needed, the expense required to fix the foot that's gone bad is so much more extraordinary than needs to happen. So prevention's everything. And like I was saying, Summit Pacific, not all 
healthcare areas are great. Summit Pacific's been great about this, but prevention's everything. So I just put this in so it just represents how much effort sometimes is required to fix something. It's a big surgery. They're going to be off work for a long time. These are circulation anomalies that happen. So sometimes your circulation suddenly shuts down, like overnight, a blockage, almost like a heart attack. And so these are medical emergencies. You can't wait a day. So these become very urgent. Um, the most common way, though, is it just diminishes over time. Gray hair shows up as we get older. You know, things as we get older slow down. And so before these things happen, and Dr. Superwall, who I don't know when he's kind of going to come in, but one of the things he said that really rang true, do you wait for the heart attack to treat a heart patient? And he's an interventional cardiologist, so that's what he fixes. But you don't want to wait for a heart attack. In our case, batteries are low. In our case... the foot has an open wound, that's kind of like having the heart attack. So prevention's become so paramount to us so we can stop, prevent these moments from happening. And we now have the ability to do it with him closer to us. So I threw in a couple of slides of him just restoring some blood flow, just like you would do for the heart, you can do to the lower extremity. And so it's Incredibly complicated, but incredibly amazing. So, the physical exam is super important. People throw away money on dumb stuff. And don't throw away money on your your health, your foot. Um, we always joke, if you want to hide money from a doctor that doesn't look at feet, just put the $100 bill in their shoe because we don't look everywhere. We don't always take their shoes off. And as a podiatrist, it's like, you guys, look at your feet every day. And so this part that I mentioned earlier where there's home monitoring going on, we're going to prevent that because we're going to check things every day and it's going to prevent it because the cost isn't $100. It's your life. It's your limb. It's work. It's fun. It's family. And so don't forget prevention prevents the cost to life. And by the cost, I mean just the cost to our soul, to doing life. Um, and then we see repeat offenders. And I mentioned earlier, education helps. And it helps a lot. But if you don't do what you're supposed to do, if you keep smoking, as a diabetic, that's bad. But the cravings are real. It's really tough for someone with diabetes to resist temptation. So whatever fail-safe methods, an accountability coach, your doctor, your podiatrist, your loved ones. Um, and we need, need to keep continuing to emphasize hemoglobin A1C. And to be honest, it's almost all of our patients knows what, knows that, what that means. And then make sure whichever doctor appointment you go to, take your shoes off. Make sure they check your feet. And we always check both feet, not the bad foot, but look at both because each one has a story to tell. Eye doctors look at both eyes for the same reason. They want to make sure. So normally for me, this is a much more interactive conversation without being able to stare into your eyes and see that you have questions, it's more difficult. And so a lot of questions arise and I don't mind if we give out my email or something because it, it's always fun to, to share information because a lot of questions come up with diabetic foot concerns. But don't wait. A lot of times we'll hear somebody say, oh, you know what, I didn't want to bug you. It happened four weeks ago, but you know, I was busy. No, call. That's what we're here for. This is what we live for. This is the reason we exist is to, to fix these things. And so the doors are always open. Thanks, Joni, for the questions and Jaden. Um, so it is informative, but it's pretty fast. A lot of stuff. 
didn't mean to focus on the scary things that can happen. You know, the shock and awe value sometimes helps because people don't notice these things. And I'd rather not see them. You know, we don't want to wait for the heart attack for the foot, which means an open wound. We want to prevent all this. Had a guy come in who hasn't been in for five years, who's in today, and he has Charco now. That's where that foot collapses. And two years ago it was starting and he didn't come in because it didn't hurt. And so, you know, we don't want to force people to come in, but whatever we can do to maintain that follow-up. I go to my dentist. Okay, I'd be lying. I go to my dentist almost once a year to get a checkup because they're going to spot things before bad things happen. And so if you're diabetic, you need to see your primary care. Most insurance is allowed to directly go to a podiatrist. But just ask questions. Take your shoes off every day. I have another slideshow that shows things that can happen in your shoes. And we take shoes off of our patients and they forget to check their shoes. I've taken a sock out of a shoe, a second sock out of a shoe, rocks, nails, kids toys. And those things cause pressure areas. Yeah, get back on track. Thanks, Joni. Um, first steps to being seen. Like I said, most of the time you just call and make an appointment. Um, we like our diabetics to just get in here. Um, if it's your family practice or you have a gatekeeper kind of insurance, you can always check with them first and then get the referral. And it depends on where you are. If you're close to us, we want to see you. But if you're not close to us, we just want you to be seen. And yes, proper foot care is important. And we forget to look. Feet are so far from our core, we don't ever check. So always check your feet daily, shoes. Um, we recommend a mirror low on your wall. So you can check your feet. That way you just hold your foot up to the wall and you can see it. Um, healthcare is changing. We're really doing a lot of prevention. And when I first started in practice in the early 90s, there were lots of amputations. And today it's just less common because people go get checked and their blood sugars are much better managed. And then I have a bunch of slides I won't go through, um, but just kind of typical days of what goes on, calluses on both second toes. Um, and for example, this person has hammer toes with numbness. You grip the ground harder, not intentional, it's just reflexive. And so this person has calluses on their second toes. And so the prevention for that, of course, is to smooth the callus down with debridement, debridement, and also orthotics. And an orthotic is really an arch support that makes the foot behave so it doesn't have to be imbalanced or have to grip too hard. And so the process is with either diabetic shoes with the custom inlays or with just orthotics, meaning foot insoles, that redistribute force so this person, for example, wouldn't have to grip the ground as firmly. And that toenail, and we can bring in Dr. Suberwall too, because really I just have a bunch of different slides where it kind of shows a callus you start looking at and then you find out that there's a split in the skin. And so these are more care slides for pressure areas. So I don't know that you want me going through all those crazy ones. And thanks, Joni. You've Hopefully we've helped you a lot. We have so many different docs and it's just been a really good mix. And when Summit Pacific invited us down, being from Montesano, I was like, I don't wanna to go to the harbor, but the reality is it's my the day I look forward to. It's so much fun to go down there. I see people I know it's just a great scenario they put together. Dr. Dietrich has a good crew happening. So fungus treatments. If your blood sugar is elevated, fungus has more ability to invade. And so with the invasion from fungus, because of blood sugar being elevated, you can either live with it 
If you take off the toenail, it often grows back without fungus if it's just one. If it's multiple toenails, you can use topicals. The topicals don't penetrate the nail well, so they're poorly successful. One of the most popular ones right now is Jublia. It has about a 30% success rate if you apply it every day for a year, which isn't the best of odds. Um, insurance tends not to try to cover that. There's um, oral medication that beats up your liver a little bit, so you have to do a liver panel. And if you have fungus everywhere, then I feel you might be a candidate to get the antifungal oral medication, getting the liver panels, of course. And then finally, um, laser. There's a laser that kills fungus. It works about 80% of the time. And then you're kind of relegated to spending your own money because it's either a hundred dollars a toenail for the three treatments or three hundred dollars a foot if all the nails are afflicted with fungus but if you leave fungus unchecked it can cause bacterial infections to show up and so for us seeing our diabetics at let's say every three months for foot care we prevent the nails from misbehaving too much Yeah, I would do recommend lotions on the feet, um, Grace, because with autonomic neuropathy, meaning the nerves that provide sweating and moisturization to the skin, the skin can't protect itself. And so it seems more dry. And so then an, either an emollient or I prefer ammonium lactate because that's somewhat acidic. So it will shed the skin and make it feel better and get better. So that's usually the lotion I prefer because you don't let the skin build up. For example, the slide on there, that person would be able to get rid of that callus almost exclusively using ammonium lactate. It'd take a few weeks, but it would work. Um, I don't want to go back to that one. And so this one, we just keep the nail thin and out of, out of trouble, but you could certainly change, treat it with uh, antifungals. So this is the bulk of what I wanted to talk about today, just to kind of switch on a light switch and have everyone think about it and let you know the doors open for us, for your family practice to kind of get things checked out. Uh, Cause if you prevent it, you don't even know what's going to happen. And Dr. Superwall, when he talks about, when he shared that it's like a heart attack, yeah, you don't want that. So prevention. Um, so that was the, the pieces I wanted to share. So thank you. So as far as getting these topical preparations, we obviously have it in the office. We're not here to make money on sales. So I prefer Costco if you're not here because it is cheaper to buy from Costco, ammonium lactate cream, um, Eucerin, Moisturel. There's a lot of emollients that are out there. They're reasonably priced. With diabetes, you lose that skin nerve that then makes your skin not able to protect itself. So Moisturizers are very helpful. And then with shoes, a frustrating thing that's happened in the last decade or so, no one measures feet anymore. They hand you a box. Here, try these on. And if you have neuropathy, you can't feel things quite as much. There's a big chance that you'll get the wrong size shoe. And so we'll even x-ray someone with their shoe on to make sure it fits well if they've had trouble in the past. Socks are tough. So Jaden asked about socks being thinner or thicker. The recommendation for white socks through the years has been just so you can spot something on the sock if your foot has a wound or something. But the blends tend to be better and a little thicker tends to be better. So plain cotton isn't the way to go. Cotton, Dacron, cotton polyester, you want the combinations because then it wicks away um, any moisture that's excessive. Okay, do we have Dr. Superwalk teed up? 
Okay. <clears throat> I wasn't able to send the link to him to be able to invite. Oh, gotcha. Um, if you could text into it, it could be quick. But we are at about 45 minutes, 50 minutes. Okay. Um, well, if we take a brief break, I'll try to get to Dr. Super while his link is not tethered in. So if that works, I'll go grab that. Let me text it to you. Awesome. I'm trying to get linked up to Dr. Superwall. As a podiatrist, our job is to kind of keep everything dialed into where we have all the services available so we can look inside um, and make sure you have your bony structures handled and special shoes. So it's it's really an interesting full plan. So this one here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no one's who does that should be able to just get in. And then I don't know if you have any other questions. I can always share my stories. I'm not sure what the slides are up next. I just wanted to be sure and have some if anybody had any additional questions. Stop me if you don't want to go through these, but I'll share some other crazy foot stories. So this is a guy who liked to dance. And because of his neuropathy, his pressure sores kept showing up. And so to help him, we had have the need to get a special shoe for dancing. Pretty simple, but it's about life. Um, and so you shave away the, the damaged flesh and it takes a few weeks for this to get back to normal. This is a pressure sore from laying in bed too long. So it's a heel pressure sore. This is somebody who dropped something on their foot and didn't feel it. It literally split through the nails, split the skin. Because of the neuropathy, they didn't notice it. And so about a week later, they're like, hey, what happened to my foot? So these are opportunities you can find the problem by checking your feet every day because they didn't know they smashed their poor toe. We forget about swelling. Swelling caused this skin to split. And so if it swells so much that your skin splits, you want to do something about your swelling. This is lichenification. It's where the scaling of skin um, turns over faster. And so it's an interesting skin condition. Yeah, and Cindy asked about bacteriophage for uh, wounds. It's out there, but it, we haven't done much of it. Um, we're going to see more of it, I think, as we get better at identifying the DNA of the bacteria that shows up on who to invite to the party. Um, but I haven't done anything with it, and I don't know anybody locally that has. This was a stub injury that got worse. Another lichenification one where the skin gets, um, it starts turning over too fast from the swelling and shrinking of the leg. So it kind of delaminates it. So it takes a few skin turns. Our skin changes out every four weeks, essentially. So there's several weeks of skin that's accumulated there. Same thing there, pressure sore in a heel. This is necrolipoidica diabeticorum. What the heck's that? It's again where the skin, because of the nerve and vascular changes, 
it evolves into this different look. Compression socks will make it go away over time, almost always. Those are my scary slides. So. I may have may have heard of Betty, uh, Betty Cutler, is it Cutter? So Dave Armstrong's a guy down in Texas who does a lot of lecturing. He's a podiatrist who is always pushing those envelopes, and we haven't done as much of it. Uh, I suspect we'll start seeing more of it when it becomes cost effective. Then it falls into play really nicely. The most Exciting thing for me in the last few years is just the placental tissues, these chorion and amnion layers you put over a wound with all the growth factors, and it just expedites wound healing crazy fast. Red light therapy we use, uh, it's in conjunction with the laser that we have. And so on someone who we can't fix their circulation, someone who we can't unload their foot, we use a class four laser mixed. It blends the two wavelengths of light um, with red light therapy, and it absolutely works. The hard part is insurance doesn't cover it. So how do you lead someone? Because it takes about 10 times to get it underway. So... I love it a lot. It's just hard to incorporate it into the care plan. And I don't know why insurance doesn't cover it. That's a question people often ask. Checking to see if Dr. Superwall is able to get in. Technology sometimes doesn't let it. Success stories. That's interesting because the whole idea is to restore people back to life. Um, a diabetic wound or some problem brings to a screeching halt work play, family, and all that. And so a recent one was somebody who had a safe fell on their foot and they were stuck in their house for many hours before someone came. So it killed the flesh on the top of the foot. And that epifix, that skin graft material from the placenta was able to restore his foot really fast. And he was out living life again and so those happen a lot, but it's it's all about getting in timely because if you wait too long and develop bone infection or you know tissue loss, then it just slows the process down. So I don't know from the back end, you guys have any sight of. Dr. Superwall. Did they ditch us? I don't think we'll be able to have him. Well, I'll share a little bit about Dr. Superwall's involvement with us. So here's a vascular guy whose glory is saving the life of someone by fixing the heart. That's where they're amazing skills are developed for. And what this guy discovered was there's an unmet need in the lower extremity. And so he came to me some time ago and asked to spend time with us. 
And in our community, we have great vascular docs for doing restoration and whatnot, but they tend not to do as much interventional that doesn't take much other than a little tube into a blood vessel. And so the way we get to him is if we have someone who comes in and on our physical exam, their circulation is less than optimal, we do a circulation test. If that PADNET, peripheral artery disease test, PADNET, is performed in its substandard, we then send that person to Dr. Superwall's team and they do a study to map the vessels. And if there's any sort of blockage, narrowing, some occlusion, he's then able to go in. He, he makes an appointment for follow up. It's essentially surgery, but it's very interventional. Um, so he'll go in and either use a laser to ablate the blockage, um, this thing that looks like a little drill, um, or a stent, which is the balloon. You stretch it out and put this new tube in. And so since he's shown up, we've really had an improvement in some cases that were getting worse and worse. We're able to change course. And so that's where his passion has become, is doing lower extremity intervention. And so I'm sure his story is much better than mine, but since he's not in the game just yet, um, there he is. Hey, Dr. Subaral, I just, I, I tried to tell your story a little bit. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so I, I have this on my phone and I'm just trying to see if, uh, if I, I, want, I had a little PowerPoint presentation for everybody. Um, I don't know how to show it to you guys, though. That's the only problem. Um, is there an email of this uh, that can be sent by any chance of the if link? You, are you viewing the PowerPoint on your phone or on a different screen? On a different screen, on my computer. Uh, if you So if you go into that link with StreamYard, and if you, um, on the bottom, it'll say share screen, you should be able to do that. Okay, I might be, I'll come back in a sec. Let me uh, try to forward that link to myself on my email. Okay, yeah, okay. that should work. All right, thank you. I'll be back. Perfect. So again, the, the coolest thing about being small town myself, getting to hang out at the awesome Summit Pacific, um, meaning questions. If someone has questions, track me down because there are so many quotes stupid questions and they're not stupid at all because if you have it it's real and so i really appreciate when people take the time to reach out and ask questions um, i can always share my email too so we can get that out there some way if you want i'm going to look up betty cutter on the the bacteriophage therapy Are there many people from Aberdeen on here? I'm a huge fan of compression stock socks because oftentimes there's swelling because the venous return. Arteries bring blood into the foot. Veins carry blood out of the foot. And sometimes the veins become a little more sluggish as we age. And so compression socks have been brilliant at um, preventing that kind of chronic swelling that I shared in one of the slides of the guy's leg who stretched so much, it split open. Um, so I'm a big fan of compression socks. Westport, okay. Out there a little ways, beautiful out there. Okay, so I'm back, but unfortunately I cannot get it to send a link to me. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep, loud okay. and clear. All right, so unfortunately this doesn't flip also, but I could theoretically flip my phone and kind of go over um, exactly 
as long That's as someone good. tells uh give me one second let me maximize this can you guys see that yes okay so um it's a little have, on the small would, side but i think that it'll be decent visible? yeah okay so i sincerely apologize i just can't get this to link to my um email but i have no disclosures but i just wanted to tell talk a little bit about peripheral artery disease and i think dr hess uh, already introduced myself. I'm an interventional cardiologist, um, currently working at one of the University of Washington hospitals, and I work also uh, in Tumwater. Um, I trained over at Duke University, where I specialize in PAD as well as interventional cardiology. Uh, and I wrote a lot about peripheral artery disease as well as critical limb ischemia when I was at Duke um, back in the days. But obviously, the importance of peripheral artery disease is that it affects more than 8 million people in the U.S. and really is associated with increased cardiovascular risk uh, and mortality. Uh, the important thing for for everyone, according to this lecture, is that it does progress to ulceration, and obviously there's a high cost of care for wound healing. So we want to try to prevent uh, the wounds as well. The risk factors for PAD, um, and I know you guys are talking about the diabetic foot, is obviously diabetes is the greatest risk factor for PAD development, as well as smoking and hypertension and hyperlipidemia. But definitely, diabetes increases the uh, risk fourfold. As we get older, the prevalence of diabetes, I'm sorry, the prevalence of peripheral artery disease gets significantly um, more as well. As you can see by the Rotterdam study, uh, as uh, patients' quintiles of age increase, the, the prevalence of PAD increased as well. And patients with PAD have a six times higher likelihood of death uh, compared to um, patients without. We did a study uh, through the Danish population, which I was a primary author, and we found and proved that PAD was a coronary um, uh, heart disease risk equivalent. We looked at about a million patients and we found that patients with PAD had very similar mortality as patients with my uh, myocardial infarction and CAD. And then even patients that have something called intermittent claudication, so just leg pain, you can see by this graph that right here, uh, their mortality um, increases over time such that only about 40 per, uh, 40 percent um, I'm sorry 60% are alive at 10 years even with just intermittent claudication um, let me just kind of um, jump to a couple of other things so patients that present um, most of the time with PAD are actually atypical symptoms 50 percent of the patients present with atypical symptoms and 33 percent with present with typical claudication and less than five to ten percent present with uh, critical limb ischemia in terms of natural history, uh, again, of all patients with PAD, about 5 to 10% present with critical limb ischemia. Critical limb ischemia itself is defined by tissue loss that, um, or rest pain that has been going on for more than two weeks. Of the patients that have claudication, which is 40%, 4% eventually require amputation. Uh, in terms of just looking at critical limb ischemia, 30% uh, of those patients get an amputation, and 45% are alive with two limbs. Surprisingly, if you look at the literature, uh, only 25% really have their critical limb ischemia that's resolved. Uh, so what I personally believe in is something called the angiosome guided therapy. What that means is that each artery in the leg feeds a specific portion of the foot. Henceforth, so I think an ABI is a garbage test personally but it's just required for a lot of insurance documentations. So for example, if the patient's ABI is normal, but their ulceration is on the top of their foot and their anterior tibial artery is occluded, well, their ABI is normal, so you would think that they don't have PAD, but the thing is they're not going to heal their wound unless you open up that anterior tibial artery. Similarly, if the wound was on the bottom of the foot, you have to theoretically open up the um, posterior tibial artery and get blood flow there or open up the anterior table artery such that the collaterals are so strong through the arch that they, they feed the territory of interest. So we do a lot of atherectomy. Atherectomy means debulking and removing the plaque. Um, we use something called a CSI rotational or orbit, orbital atherectomy, which is basically a diamond cutter. And we have that kind of spin around uh, in our office, we also use a lot of laser. We literally just burn some of that plaque away. Um, we stick in different parts of patient's legs. In this patient, I stuck in the thigh just because I couldn't get the artery open up here. So I actually stuck in the occlusion, took a wire and snaked it through the occlusion, 
And then I opened up this territory. Um, here's just us working in with our setup with all of our devices that we use. This patient, we went through the groin, but we do do go through the foot quite often. About 30% to 50% of our cases are going through the foot. Um, so we use very small devices. I use an ultrasound to gain access with a needle and I go ahead and thread a wire down. And then um, what I do next is I put a small sheath. The sheath is about two millimeters in diameter. And from that sheath, I take a wire as well as balloons and I'm able to try to open up those arteries. Um, here's me going through the groin, but we similarly just use two millimeter wires uh, to open up going through the groin as well. Um, I'm sorry, two millimeter uh, sheaths or tubes to open up the arteries. Here's sort of the pre and post. This is the patient's SFA or superficial femoral artery that's severely diseased. And this is after we just do a balloon angioplasty of it. This is a patient where their popliteal artery, so behind their knees, 100% included, and you can't see anything before. And here's our result post after we balloon it open. Similarly, this is another patient with a popliteal and SFA disease right here. You can see it's occluded, and then we balloon it open. Those are just a couple of examples. And I know that this is just a very quick, quick overview of uh, what we do and the services that we can offer patients. But I think it's definitely worth, um, given the patient's mortality uh, dramatically increases after they have an amputation, um, it's, it's worth to try to save the foot as much as possible. Uh, for us, a minor amputation described as a transmetatarsal or smaller is a win. A major amputation, um, the quality of life of a patient does go down and the literature does show that their risk of mortality goes up quite a bit. Some of that is also social factors where they become very depressed and don't move around a lot and then stop taking medicines and et cetera. But that's a very, 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 very brief overview of what we do. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And I know that I, I didn't want to take too much time, so I kind of flew through everything. I just know that the addition of you for us, has it's huge because this is sort of a therapy that isn't that available here. And so for us, it's really going to make a nice difference. So thank you yeah. for sharing. No, thank you so much for inviting us, um, inviting me. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks for all the hard work and, and care you provide for the patients. They truly love your practice. We are saving some legs for us. So thanks yes, for that. Sir. Thank you. Even better. Thank you. Um, see if anyone has questions. Um, Barbara asked about her nerve conditions that are different based on diabetes and other familial conditions. And for us, neuropathy comes in many forms. It comes from diabetes. And like Dr. Superwall said, it's not just diabetes that restricts blood flow or that inhibits nerve function. So no. It's just threshold. So if it's bad, we want to do something good. And so exactly. Really exactly. From the PAD perspective, there is an entity also called ischemic neuropathy. So um, we found that when we do open up patients, and there's literature out there, when you open up their 100% occlusions, yes, you don't improve their neuropathy completely, but you can get like a 10 to 30% improvement in their neuropathy. And in all honesty, sometimes it's truly not neuropathy, but that's their intermittent claudication. So some patients will just say, I just have numbness and tiredness and fatigue in my legs. And we sometimes just think that that's neuropathy. But remember I, how one of the slides showed that 55% of the patients actually present with atypical symptoms. So that's some of the atypical symptoms that you should be theoretically um, in tune with and think about ordering an ultrasound on those patients to see if uh, perhaps they do have peripheral artery disease. And ultrasound is what um, we can do to look inside and find the blockages. So then it makes Dr. Superwell's job easier because then he knows where he's going. Exactly. And, and what we found, in all honesty, doing this for so many years, again, an ABI test is great um, as an initial screener. But how many times have we ordered an ABI test and it's normal? And it's just, again, because you could have theoretically, you can miss so much on an ABI. The ultrasound is better. Obviously, the angiogram is the gold standard, but the ultrasound is better because you can see an abnormal waveform. Um, and at that point, you know that there's something going on and some sort of blockage upstream. And, and our hope is that we won't have as many wounds that we send your way. We'll have yeah. people that are looking like their circulation is diminishing. So we'll restore them before the, what you told me, heart attack, before their bad foot condition shows up. Exactly. So Even like a small little laceration in a patient. And, and if you can catch it in time and open up blood flow, 
you'll allow that to heal markedly okay. faster yeah. than an open wound with necrotic mm -hmm. tissue. Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to be really nice having you around. And our, yeah. I think the outcomes are no, thank you better so much, than guys. I expected because it just, it's done. It's the next day. They're fine. You know, it really changes it pretty fast. So. All right. Sorry. I lost you guys for a sec. Is there any other questions? What I said is if somebody has any questions, they can certainly reach out to me and I can always hit you up for those questions too. Wonderful. All right, guys. Take care. Have a great night. Okay. Thanks, Terry, for letting me talk. Hey, thanks for hanging out. Bye. See ya.